A child's death that has haunted the town of Pekin for the past year. On November 18th, 13-year-old Robert B. was reported as a runaway by his mother. However, we have been in touch with the Illinois State Police and are in the process of entering information of a missing or endangered person advisory. And what happened to Robert B. brought people in Pekin out to search for answers themselves weekend after weekend. Thousands of leads poured into the Pekin Police Department. The search for the teenager coming to a halt on a hot July day when his skeletal remains were found. So I, got, I finally got to talk to Nicole, which I was super stoked about because I really felt like we needed to clear up this angle. I yeah. didn't know if there was like a lot of validity to either of them being involved, but I still needed to go down the road to make sure so we could continue down some of the other paths we're on. Yeah. And so I was really excited because after the episode aired, both Nicole and the gentleman who we had referred to the psychic in the last episode who prefers to be called a spirit to spirit some you know contact spirit to spirit or clairvoyant okay. um and they were both very forthcoming and were were you know not not only willing but very open to giving me information and telling me the whole story which was great so i think one thing that everyone on the facebook groups after we finished that episode and after it aired um kind of went after the clairvoyant and Nicole and we're like, what are you involved? Like, why aren't you coming forward? Why aren't you giving them information? And so Nicole actually said to me and she was speaking and this is taken straight from the transcript of the call. And she was speaking about the, the influx of comments she got after that episode aired. Yeah. And so she said, everyone kept saying, who is Nicole? She had a part in it. Why wouldn't she come forward? So Nicole's response to that, which I thought was very obvious almost, but still surprising, was, well, because it was three years ago, I didn't think it would happen. I tried to come forward in January of 2017, and they said, oh, there's too many psychics. We don't believe her. So I think you have someone who's who's kind of this person who's like, well, no, 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 I, I, I am trying to give my information. I did come forward. I did tell people. And then when nothing was done about it and it didn't make any difference. I think she just kind of faded into the background. She's like, I'm not having an impact here. So I, I think that that's amazing. The fact that it, with all of this backlash, she was still like, I want to tell this story. And then at some point was just like, okay, I'm not helping anything. So I'm just going to stand in the background, but I'm not going to keep commenting on everything. And I mean, January of 2017, if, if I'm not mistaken, that was still pretty early on in the whole, the searching process because the police hadn't really gotten involved until that month. You know, there was they were aware from November through December, but it wasn't until it was like the third or the fifth that the bow hunter finally got a follow up call and an interest in what he had seen from from beforehand. So there was there was a lot of things like it seems like Nicole was on the forefront of bringing information. Yeah. Um. Yet because of the nature of it and, and the kind of, I mean, I, I guess if you go to the police and say, you know, I, I spoke to my clairvoyant and they told me that we need to go look out over here, they, they'd be skeptical. But, but the idea that because she wasn't listened to was also her fault. Yeah. Seems a little crazy to me. The clairvoyant didn't reach out to Nicole. That was one of the first questions I asked her because okay. I thought it was so spooky because if you look at the map that the clairvoyant provides, it's probably about a half a square mile. So it's not a big space, but yeah. Bonsai's bones literally were found in the middle of the map. And I mean, that makes my hair stand on end. So that's why I thought like there had to be some connection but then Nicole was like no 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 he didn't reach out to me I reached out to him yeah and then furthermore he lives over 300 miles away and has never been to Pekin at all and then it was it kind of really started to hit home so this was somebody Nicole had known 
from online and she had gone back and forth with about information apparently about her own family and other things that she was interested in and so when the bonsai case came up she was like oh maybe i'll see if he has any because he's a spirit to, he can connect with spirits so um i think she was like i i want to find out if he could maybe tell me something about bonsai and so he he listened to what she had to say and he took a day and then he got back to her i believe it was the following day or a couple of days later with with things he saw and those I'm sure they weren't vague to him, but they seem kind of vague in the broad scheme of things. He was yeah. talking about like high power lines, train tracks, water, a school. So he was, he was talking about some of these things. So I think one thing that's amazing is Nicole never wanted to be the middleman. Yeah. So immediately upon getting this information from a uh, clairvoyant that she trusted, she immediately tried to start passing the information on to other people. And she reached out to some people who would be the first natural people you would reach out to on the case. Um, but they were probably overwhelmed at the time. I'm sure, you know, you have a missing child and it's not something you can really take in at that point. And so th that kind of fell on deaf ears. So she kept asking people. So she saw that Brooke was incredibly involved in the searches. So she reached out to Brooke to see if Brooke had or would would listen to this information and maybe search in the areas that she was saying. So the where they ended up searching was kind of a collaboration between Nicole and Brooke. Nicole was sharing the information the clairvoyant had given and Brooke was like, wow, I'm very familiar with Pekin. So that seems like it might be in these areas. So yeah. she started going to these areas that the clairvoyant that she felt the clairvoyant was talking about to do her searches. I mean, I think it's really interesting that you have so much, or we'll call it a lack of response, uh, um, to what she says, especially if she's contacting the family, I'm, I'm just assuming in January as well, where, where again, it's probably been a really frustrating two months of, of not hearing a lot of response back from the authorities or, or what's going on and, and yet another person online that you don't know that doesn't really know the case has a, a friend with a feeling or like I'm, I'm not sure how it would be presented um how i i can imagine i would react would be very similar so i don't i don't feel like i want to blame anyone for having yeah. not listened to her but i also really feel like brooke should be commended for for one not just like acting on that kind of we'll call it faith that that someone's giving you information that's worthwhile that when time is so necessary in this case yeah you're willing to spend the time doing it but also to like to really kind of take that general knowledge and have that kind of like inside man stance and and start acting on it immediately the the three of them are nicole and brooke both just that kind of complete strangers yet coordinating so smoothly yeah. And they were so accurate as well. So I think it's really interesting because you have Nicole kind of caught in the middle here. And so she's talking to the spirit to spirit contactor on one hand and then she's talking to Brooke on the other. And so she's trying to make sure that the clairvoyant is seeing Brooke and the group of searchers that have yeah. gone out specifically searching. So Nicole starts asking questions just to make sure that he is seeing what Bro the Brooke and them's group because I guess there can be some cloudiness around that. So. Nicole was specifically asking, like, what are the people wearing? Um, you know, tell us what, what things look like. And the, the clairvoyant was able to very much say things, like uh, from a shoe being untied to um, the type of headband someone was wearing, and then was able to give very clear um, identifying markers about the property that yeah. they were searching on. So I think that that's really telling. And they were about eight houses away from the truth there. And who knows? We don't even know this house might be connected because I think is what's crazy is this past week after that episode came out, we got photos of the house at that time. Yeah. So we see the open window. We see the um, notebook open on the bed. You know, we see the things that they're talking about. So even one more level of credit to the story is that somebody took, kept the pictures and, and that is how it looked at the time. Yeah. So that's really surprising and you you wonder if any of this has a connection to bonsai or if it's just some some something else weird that's happened with this case is it just an abandoned house with a open window and the, a binder that has absolutely nothing to do with bonsai because that's not an impossibility right or does it is this binder connected to him was he in that house was yeah was he in the house because that's something that's always been we we never have like an exact date we don't know what happened really after 
you know, he was seen by the butts. Yeah. So it, it's it's a matter of was he staying somewhere, trying to avoid having to go into juvenile detention because of his history, or was it something more nefarious? Has always been a question that we've only been able to kind of really hypothesize about. And what I have to also say, because I have to backtrack a moment here, because I think in the last episode we were very much like, why didn't the cops look into this? But what I found out is they did. They did look into this. Okay. Yeah, which is crazy. So apparently uh, the clairvoyant had to provide like references to cases he had worked before uh, to other law enforcement. Like he had to give all of this over and the cops in Pekin apparently checked all of this out. Wow. And then we're also just checked him out and they had an interview over the phone with him, I guess, for it, it must have gone on for like 90 minutes, it sounds, where they like asked him about everything because they wanted to make sure that he didn't have a connection. Yeah. So I, I have to, I'm happy, I'm so happy to hear that the cops did that because I do feel like you have to eliminate him. And I, I hate that. I hate that because someone came forward with information that now they're a suspect because it shouldn't be like that. But I do feel like you have to look at how someone obtained information just to make mm -hmm. sure that they're not a suspect. It doesn't mean like everyone on the planet's a suspect and you have to point fingers, but it does mean I do need to ask a few questions yeah. so I, then I can get myself back on track and then I can use your information appropriately. Haven't we heard people say that they searched that space months before he was found and it was empty? Right. So is it, is it somebody knows all these details who's putting the body in, What's, a, yeah, like, in the space? Or is it, is it just pure coincidence that somebody dumps this body in a place where a lot of people seem to be searching and focused on. So, I mean, I feel like that's, we have to keep that in mind as we continue. Yeah. Hello. Hello, is this Steven? Yeah, one and the same. Oh, perfect. Um, this is Ash with uh, doing the documentary ser a series on Bonsai. Yeah, yeah. Obviously, in the episode, I don't know if you were watching the series or not, but I know it caused some chaos to erupt there, which was, of course, not our intention, but those Facebook groups go wild with anything. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, I watched that episode. Uh, I watched it 10 times. Oh, okay. <laughs> so basically, you have an ability, um, and Nicole was trying to explain it to me that it was like a spirit to spirit contact type ability. Can you explain that to me a little bit? Or it's not explainable. <laughs> no, well, uh, for years it wasn't to me. Yeah. But then, you know, I, I'm not a psychic and I'm not a medium. Okay. Uh, I do have a sixth sense. And I'm very clairvoyant. And I'm also blessed with spiritual discernment. In other words, being able to judge people. Mm -hmm. And my connection, usually, if someone calls me... Just, just as an example, if someone calls me and says, you know, so-and-so's missing, can you help us? Uh, if the individual is not deceased, I can tell the family uh, he's not deceased, he's just distressed. In other words, he's lost mentally or physically. Okay. But my thing is, and with the cases I've had in the past, if I actually see a location, in detail, what I'm seeing is through my own spiritual eyes, through the spiritual eyes of the deceased. In other okay. words, I can, I can see what's around these okay. individual because most of the time when someone goes missing, it's a traumatic experience. Yeah. And the spirit, and the spirit has a tendency to linger and look at the flesh and go, well, you know, what's going on? Because they don't understand what's going on because I was alive, now I'm not and I see myself, what's going on. To be honest with you, I've, I've spent years trying to figure out what, what it is I can do. Yeah. And it, and it still boggles my mind because see, I'm 300 miles away from Pekin. Oh, wow, holy cow, That's, that just blew my mind. <laughs> I did not realize that. <laughs> and I've, I've never been to Pekin. Okay. <laughs> Wow. Okay. So you're 300 miles away. And I mean, I'm assuming you were, you lived where you live now when this was all happening. Yes. Yes. Wow. I've lived here for 27 years. Okay. So when the day that, um, Nicole had reached out to you about bonsai, 
what, when someone reaches out about a case that you're not familiar with yet, what, 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 what's your process then? You just kind of sit with it and see if anything comes, or how do you do that? I usually see less than more. Okay. Uh, now, with this young man, when he, when Nicole got, he was already deceased. When okay. Nicole got hold of me. Oh, okay. He was already, he was already deceased. Mm -hmm. What I was seeing was a South of Pekin, tall tower lines, and a school, and a wooded area, and railroad tracks. Okay. And I was also seeing that he was taken there in a pickup truck old and the individual that was driving it uh he jumped for a living in other words he picked up scrap metal okay and then from, and from there uh it basically went with with the search and with the uh with the house mm -hmm. and yes yes that was that was robert's safe haven Oh, so interesting. So your interpretation was the, the house that um, Brooke had gotten close to that Nicole was kind of speaking for you to Brooke. That house there he had been in before or he had found it to be a safe place before. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. But as far as my gift, uh, I wish I could explain it better. I just know it works. I mean, this is not my first one. Yeah, it didn't sound like it from what Nicole was saying. Have you actually... Um, helped on other cases and stuff like that, or what? What kind of stuff have you did, or just do you offer solace to a family, or how you know, or it just depends on what it is. In the last seven years, I've found four. Wow. Okay. And to me, that's a tremendous thing. But also, the sad part is, with those four, there's probably eight where I actually went to law enforcement and said, "I told you so. Why didn't you listen?" Wow, that's amazing. And I don't mean to boast, but I've never been wrong on my locations. Right. But the reason why I walked away from it after Brooks searched, and I stayed with Sergeant Rainey until the month of uh, December. Okay. And then I walked away from it. This is something that I've, I've learned to do with my gift. Mm-hmm. Because I know it was nefarious. And law enforcement, see, Sergeant Rainey gave me the third degree. He wanted to know names of people that I've dealt with in the past. Oh, wow. Police departments I worked with. And see, those are questions. And that's what bothers me with the family or law enforcement. When they ask questions, don't ask questions. Just go where I say. If you start asking questions, what are you guilty of? Hmm. Interesting. And that's why, yeah, see, that's why I deal with family. I mean, if, they, if someone contacts me and says, Grandpa went missing, what do you know? And if I give them a location and they say, well, why is he there? You're mm -hmm. asking a question. Okay, Go I see. Right you. Yeah. yeah. Was, you, was you involved? That type of thing. Yeah, absolutely. So throughout a lot of this episode, we were talking to searchers from Trucks for Kids, which is one of the major search groups that had come through and to try to help with the Bonsai case. And then we also have Central Illinois Sonar Search and Rescue, who also helped out, um, especially with the tips regarding Trucks for Kids. So we talked to people from these groups. Um, all of them wanted to remain anonymous, and some had even signed uh, pretty serious NDAs, so they didn't want to get in trouble for, for being on camera, but they did want to tell us the information that they knew. So a lot of this episode, we use, are using transcripts and either retelling the conversations that we um, had with them, or we're reading straight from the transcripts. Our sources are really important to us, so we never want to out someone who's giving us information, especially this information is so valuable to this case. I'm the one that called Trucks for Kids and sent them there. When I first got involved, I went and talked with Lisa. Okay. Uh, and that was down in Auburn, Illinois. Okay. Had, had a short conversation with her. Everything was fine. She wasn't worried. He was just missing, blah, blah, blah. And when would you say, so I know she was down Auburn, when, what, like month, or do you have any idea around when it was? It, it was like right when she first went there, but okay. no, I mean, I, 
I deal with 10,000 people and things a day. Yeah. Honestly, I don't remember, like, the time. Okay, perfect. Nope, that's good. So, okay. Talk to her. Everything didn't really make sense. She was all over the place. I mean, I, I deal with mobile home parks, so I deal with people on drugs all the time. Okay. And she was strung out. There, without a doubt in my mind, I bet my wealth and my life on it. Mm-hmm. She was on drugs when I was talking to her. Okay. She didn't really give any information. She acted like it wasn't a big deal. Said that they'll find him when he's ready to be found, blah, blah, blah. Then I talked with the guy, guys from trucks. I met them there in Deacon one day. We chit-chatted. Everything was fine. We were all kind of looking around together. They were fighting with the group of girls because it was like trucks was going to solve the case, but the group of girls was going to solve the case, and they all hated everybody. <laughs> so I was kind of the mediator between them. Okay. And... Everything was going along fine. Finally, I don't even remember what it was. Stephanie made some comments that didn't add up. I talked to and I said, look, somebody needs to go sit down with Lisa. I'm not going to do it because I don't want to be in the middle of it. Mm -hmm. So went and met with Lisa. Okay. And I don't remember exactly where it was. But I want to say it was some farm somewhere she had moved to okay. and was staying at. Why was meeting with Lisa? She was calling me, telling me bits and pieces. I'd call trucks to find out if they heard anything about it. And we were kind of pushing what questions to ask Lisa. Yeah. And there had been a comment made, and I, to this day I can't figure out who made the comment. Mm-hmm. But about Christmas decorations and this and that being laid around everywhere. Okay. And something came up about bonsai being cut up and put into a box. Okay. Or a barrel. Okay. So I called her and I said, you know, talk to her about this and just take what she says and feed into it and just get her to talk and see what she'll say. Okay. Shortly after that conversation, she called me back. And she was hysterical. Okay. And told me he was cut up, put into a tote that the Christmas decorations came out of, mm -hmm. and he was thrown off the 474 bridge. Wow, okay. I immediately took that, and I, did, I can't remember the kid's name anymore from Trucks, um, but if you call him, I called him, this was, I want to say in the middle of the week when this happened. Okay. We set up to get the boats up here, I was getting my boat up here, and we were going to search that stretch of the river. Okay. Because we had had a flood. And if I remember right, a lot had been flooded before that okay. when they were trying to do the searching. And uh, trucks went out, they got there a day earlier than what we talked about, and boom, they found this stuff right there. Uh, and, it, and it was exactly what he said it was going to be. Yeah. He was put inside of a coat and thrown off the bridge. So there were four boats, and we're searching and searching and searching and not really finding anything. And uh, one of the boats says, I'm going to go up here on the shore because we know it's near a bridge, basically. So one of the boats goes up there, and they find the evidence. We found teeth, a vertebrae, a green coat, duct tape, a pillowcase with blood on it, a scarf with blood on it, uh, a sock, and a red and gray shirt that was similar to the one he has in the picture on a billboard. The Shade Loman Bridge goes across from East Peoria to Bartonville. So Bartonville police, uh, just a patrol officer, shows up. And he kind of looks at it and he says, well, I better call a supervisor. So 
So I'm assuming the guy that came was the chief. I, I don't know that for a fact, but I mean, I assume that's who he was. So he gets there and he looks over the thing and so he calls Peoria because I guess on the bridge somewhere, it's, uh, it's, it's real close to being two different jurisdictions. So this guy that I assume is the chief, again, I don't know that for a fact, uh, he was a supervisor. And then this guy from Peoria, who I have no idea who he was, had an argument for about an hour over whose jurisdiction this was. And that neither one of them could afford to pay for a murder case because you're looking at at least a million dollars minimum. So in the midst of this argument, Peoria leaves, then we're still there. So they basically got some uh, index cards and they put a number by each of the items and took a picture, but they didn't like tape anything off. And uh, mind you, there's still 20 people tracing through this crime scene. And um, they took down our names, uh, all our driver's license numbers, and they basically told us that if we put any of this on social media, then we can be charged with it. Uh, that, that's crazy. I mean, I just want to make sure that I'm understanding this. So basically, you guys find these items under the bridge and the cops, when they show up, get in an argument instead of one of them taking responsibility for the items and they do this for over an hour? That seems insane. Yeah. Yeah, neither of them wanted responsibility. Okay, so they marked everything, took pictures, threw everything in garbage bags, and was gone. No state police, no crime lab, and they tried to tell me that the teeth that we found on the sandbar were fish teeth. And I looked at the guy and I said, do you think I'm stupid? And he's just like, well, they're fish teeth, believe whatever you want. And so I got home that night and I knew better, but I Googled fish with human-like teeth and the only fish that came up was one in half. Wow. Uh, yeah, sorry, you were cutting up a little there at the end, but it sounds like they tried to convince you it was fish teeth, but you actually did some research on your own, and the only fish you found with human-like teeth was in Africa? Yeah. So I, re I really spent this last couple weeks getting in hold of uh, forensics experts and a body farm to see if we can actually go out and interview them and talk about what kind of bones that they had there, and then... Um, if they do have something to do with bonsai, trying to figure out where those bones ended up. We had our command post set up at Salvation Army, so it was just right up the road. Okay. So we were running teams from, you know, a couple teams would go out and search for a while. I was having us do like every two hours. Um, either we had to call and check in or we had to go back to Salvation Army, so command center, and then another, another couple of teams would go out. We all ended up being suspects, and then they dropped that off when they realized that we were all from St. Louis area and not from up there. Detective Rainey was like, you guys need to get out of town. You need to quit working on this case. You need to just turn over everything you guys have. And it's like, excuse me, you know, we worked way too hard for this information. We're not just going to hand it over to you. Yeah, right. Like, we've talked to people that won't talk to the cops. We've yeah. talked to people that don't want their names out there because they gave us information and they're scared. So we just worked around him. Wow, that's crazy. We ended up just completely going around him and everything that we found, we turned over to state police. Yeah, that's what surprises me, is you think everyone would be like so thankful and grateful that there was a team of qualified investigators who all hearts were in the right place, um, using their own time and resources and energy to be out there looking and then to have that sort of response. And it's crazy. I can't believe how many of the people who are investigating this are, are reluctant to talk. And I think that tells a lot. But as we keep going forward here, we're, I feel like we're breaking down more walls. And that makes me really happy because we need as many people as we can to come forward and tell their stories so that we can at least help put pressure on the police or, uh, or figure out some information ourselves. When we first started going out there to investigate, we had to prove to them how many cases we had closed. And really? at the time, we, when we went up there and started investigating, we were at 306 cases closed. Holy cow, I didn't realize that Trucks for Kids had that kind of record. That's impressive. Mm -hmm. And they just saw two more uh, a few days ago. And they're probably up to like 400 and something now. Wow. So, I mean, he's, he's closed a lot of cases, and a lot of them, it's not just him finding them, like they've come home or the police have found them or. 
Right. You know, we had something to do with it, you know, them coming home. But we had to prove to them how many cases we had worked and how many cases we had closed. And it was like we were proving ourselves to them for them calling us that. Yeah, and then it came down to they were more worried about what we were doing and where we lived at and where our home addresses were and our phone numbers were and who all was on the team and everything else than they were the case. Yeah, that's, that's yeah, definitely true. Like when you that personal, we're just going to close off. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I would, too, if I was, like, out there helping and doing all that. Then someone started questioning me in a weird way. I would definitely want to get a, as far away from that as humanly possible. And that's what we told you, too. We're like, dude, we're leaving our kids at home to come work this case. And then you have people asking us what our personal addresses are and what our phone numbers are. And, no, dude, our kids are home. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and, and that got to a lot of us, too. Yeah. So now trying to get people to talk about it, it's like, are we going to go back through that again? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> and how many, so, how many, uh, in, or searchers would you say there was on any given day? Uh, just from the Chuck's kids team? Yeah. Um, 10 to 12. Wow, okay. And did you guys kind of systematically search areas, like specific grid type searches, or? Yeah. Okay. All right. And uh, like each time we went up, we searched a different area. Okay, so yeah, you're kind of just checking them off the list as you went, area by area. Yeah. Okay. But it wasn't just a one time go through and search, search deal. Okay. It was, we would search an area, you know, one weekend and then like the following weekend, we would go through a different area. Okay, that makes sense. And then we would go back through that first area just to make sure that we didn't miss anything or, you know, somebody had moved something or, you know, whatever the case was. Oh, wow. Just so to double check through. ourselves. Yeah. So we were continuously, or like we'd send half of a team to one area to search and another another set of team to go search an area that maybe had already been searched. And how many times would you say on the area besides behind Keith Brackett's uh, relative's property there where his body was actually found eventually, did you, would you say you searched back there? I'd say at least five or six. Wow. Oh, wow. Okay. And not more. Now, now none of us understand how the bones were supposedly there. Yeah, it feels like. there's so many times. Yeah, I've had my suspicions about it being a dump job since the very beginning, so, and I feel like everything keeps pointing to that that's probably what happened here. So, the other thing I'm going to tell you is the property where the body was found. Mm -hmm. I can tell you with 110% certainty that that property was walked, where the body was found was walked, the inside of the little shed building there mm -hmm. was broken into and walked. Okay. And I'm telling you with 110% certainty, because I was there, if I can find the card off of my drone, I will get that to you, and I can give you drone footage of that property probably two months before the body was found. Oh, showing you my that God. it was not there. Wow, so you were, that's crazy. See, this is amazing. Okay, so you were out there, and so it is, it, according to your recollection, there was definitely no body, and you walked or saw people walk right along that fence line. I didn't see people walk. I personally, personally walked. Okay, that's awesome. This is really because great. Okay. It, came, it came to me that that property had never been searched and that they would not give them permission to do it. Is it it's, isn't it wild? That it like blows my mind how many people searched in and around that area. Like, I am so shocked that that was like but, such but a point. Tell you something. Mm hmm. If I remember correctly, the time that they were going to go over there and search that yeah. was after was meeting with Lisa. Oh, interesting. Okay. 
And the reason why I personally went over there is because I had talked with and I don't remember who her sidekick at the time was because it changed every time those girls got to fighting. Okay, yep, absolutely. <laughs> and we were talking about what had been searched, what hadn't, and blah, blah, blah. And this was before she went and met with Lisa down at the farm or whatever. Okay. It was. Mm -hmm. So it was before we knew about the tent and stuff. Okay, interesting. And that property came up, that, and I had never really heard anything about it, that it was owned by this kid that thought did it, and he wouldn't let them search it. Mm -hmm. So I just went. Yeah. I thought, what's, what's the worst they're going to do? Yeah, right. And oh. I, I, they, they said, you know, well, we've been threatened that they'll take us to jail for trespassing. And I thought, you know what, worst case scenario, I got to pay a little fine and bond money for trespassing. Mm -hmm. And I, I remember I went to the ATM and I got out like a thousand or two thousand dollars from the ATM just in case Beacon police arrested me for it. Wow. Went over there and I just wanted to know. Yeah. And at first I parked across the street and I had a really nice DJI drone. I flew my drone all over in the, there trying to look down and see if there were any campsites in there, looking around, and then I walked over, went inside the barn. I, I, I'm telling you, Ash, with 100% certainty, mm -hmm. that stuff was not there.